All right, well, as I've mentioned this evening, <clears throat> we're continuing uh, in the uh, Sermon on the Plain, as it were, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, at least, uh, Luke's um, account of it. And uh, this evening, we're going to be finishing that uh, paragraph that I was speaking about this morning that has all the different elements in it. So what I'd like us to do is just simply read the part we're going to look at this evening, which is Luke chapter 6, uh, in verses uh, 43 through 45. And again, speaking about how we identify um, a true believer and one who is at least not. And again, realizing there's a lot that goes into this. Uh, we can't see the heart. We don't know why people behave the way that they behave, but we, we are to look for patterns. And uh, that's what our Lord is calling us uh, to do this evening. So Luke chapter 6, beginning in verse 43, Jesus says this, for there is no good tree which produces bad fruit, nor on the other hand, a bad tree which produces good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they pick grapes from a briar bush. The good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good. And the evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil. For his mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. Well, may the Lord bless this portion of his word to our understanding this evening. Now, again, Jesus told us that um, when, uh, when we're mistreated for, for doing what is right, for being, uh, being what the Lord calls us to be, um, uh, that we shouldn't retaliate but return love for hatred. Uh, blessing for cursing, prayers for mistreatment, forgiveness for injustice. Uh, in short, our Lord Jesus told us that we need to be merciful to unkind and ungrateful men, even as our Heavenly Father uh, is merciful to them. Now, one of the greatest mercies that we can show anyone, and, and particularly our, our enemies, and in a certain sense, really everybody who is outside of the body of Christ, everybody who is an unbeliever, is in a certain sense our enemy. Uh, they may not know it yet, uh, but they, they'll behave that way when we uh, begin to reflect Jesus Christ to them. One of the greatest mercies we can show them is to help them see their need of our Lord Jesus Christ. And to do that, we need to be able to point out their sins. Now, what Jesus said this morning may have primarily to do with how we are to treat our brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, um, as far as the, the speck and the log, but it equally applies to how we are to minister to unbelievers. We shouldn't try to uh, help them see their sins, point out their sins, unless we first deal with our own sins, particularly if ours happen to be more glaring, if ours happen to be more obvious, if they happen to be worse, which, uh, you know, they really shouldn't be if we belong to the Lord. But obviously, if we haven't dealt with our own imperfections and our own sins and we try to help them uh, find their way to Jesus Christ, in the end, we're going to end up doing more harm than good. And as Jesus pointed out this morning, we'll appear to them to be nothing more than hypocrites. But of course, dealing with our own sins will give us the necessary humility that we need to be able to deal with others in the way that will best help them, and that is with gentleness. So let's remember that we need to uh, be aware of the kind of fruit we're producing, as it were. If, if we're going to uh, share the gospel with someone else, they need to be able to see the light or the fruit shining from us. Now, when Jesus has been throughout this sermon speaking about blind guides, when he's been warning us about those we should be careful uh, to sit under, uh, of dealing with specks in a brother's eyes while we have logs, as it were, in our own eyes, he has been warning us against a pharisaical uh, attitude. Um, now, why the Pharisees were like the way they are is what Jesus zeroes in on this evening. It's because of their nature. It's because of what is in their hearts. Now, Jesus said that just as you can tell, or tells us here, just as you can tell the nature of a tree uh, by the kind of fruit that um, grows on it, 
So you can tell the nature of a person by the things that they do, by the fruit their lives produce. Now, what Jesus is telling us here is not only going to help us uh, evaluate our own hearts, because I believe, you know, as Jesus speaks to his disciples and he tells them these very things, he intends for them uh, to deal with their own lives and to examine their own hearts where it is that we stand with the Lord, but it's also going to help us evaluate others, whether we should receive them as the Lord's or whether we should see them as an object of evangelism. Now, Jesus first tells us that um, every tree produces fruit according to the kind of tree that it is. Again, he says in verses 43 and 44, For there is no good tree which produces bad fruit, nor on the other hand a bad tree which produces good fruit, for each tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they pick grapes from a briar bush. Now, last week we noted that um, Jesus spoke in parables from time to time. And uh, the reason why he did that was he wanted to hide the truth from certain individuals. And at the same time, he wanted to reveal it to others. Well, this isn't uh, a parable, okay? This is what we call an analogy. And analogies are meant to take truths that are spiritual in nature, things that maybe we can't necessarily see with our eyes, and to make them more accessible to an audience. Everybody who is hearing this particular analogy, this particular image, would immediately know uh, that what our Lord Jesus Christ says is obviously true. Good trees or useful trees are the kind of trees that bring forth good or useful fruit, while bad trees or useless trees produce bad or useless fruit. Now, um, I think what Jesus is talking about here is, is not necessarily uh, two of the same kinds of trees. I think we, we kind of look at this as um, maybe Jesus is saying, well, you, know, you can look at two apple trees and maybe one is uh, bearing useful fruit and the other one's bearing uh, you know, useless fruit because it's a sick tree. Or maybe, uh, you know, cherry trees, you know, maybe there's a good tree and a bad tree. One produces good fruit, the other one just seems not to be able to produce anything that's of any use. Uh, though it's certainly possible to have good and bad trees in, in that sense. But I think that what he's talking about here are two different kinds of trees or two different kinds of plants. One that is useful because it's bearing useful fruit. It's, it's the nature of that tree to bear useful fruit. And the other, useless, for the same reason. And the reason why I think that Jesus is talking more about that is because of what, what he says in, in, our, in these two verses. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they pick grapes from a briar bush. What he's saying is that you don't get useful fruit from plants that are by nature useless. You know, you don't, um, basically you, you, um, you know that something happens to be of, of use or that it's a good plant or a useful plant because it is bearing useful fruit uh, by looking at the kind of fruit it produces. Again, thorns and briar bushes don't produce useful fruit. They are useless plants. The plant is known by the kind of fruit it either bears or doesn't bear. Okay. Now, of course, his point is more important, uh, the reason why he uses the analogy. Because the same thing is true when it comes to people. He says in verse 45, The good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good, and the evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil, for his mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. Now, how can we tell if someone is good or evil, uh, useful or useless when it comes to the kingdom of God? How do we know whether a person is a believer or an unbeliever? It's by the kind of fruit that their life bears. Now, obviously, you and I cannot see anyone's heart. Only the Lord can see the heart. Only he knows the true state, the true nature of anyone. But we can see their life. And Jesus tells us that their life shows us what is actually in their heart. 
Now, the heart, as we know, is, is basically the, the affections of the soul. When, when Jesus talks about the heart, he's not talking about the physical organ that's pumping blood in our chest, but he's talking about our affections. Our affections are basically the way we incline. You know, we, we, we incline a certain way morally, one way or the other. Our affections are what determine what we're going to choose. Basically, we say that our affections determine our will. You know, we talk about in, in uh, theology uh, what we call the, the freedom of the will. Is man's will free or is man's will not free? Well, in a certain sense, it is free, right? Every man may choose what he wants. That's the freedom that he has. But what he wants is determined by his heart. It's determined by his affection. And that can be bound by sin or it can be released by the Holy Spirit. It's what determines what it is we're going to choose. We choose what we want, what we desire, and we don't choose what we don't want. Now, the point is, if our affections are good, if our heart is good, and certainly our heart is good, though not purely so, if we have been born again by the Spirit of God, if we've savingly trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, if he has cleansed our hearts by the washing of regeneration by the Holy Spirit, again, which is what Jesus talked to Nicodemus about in the new birth. If our hearts have been cleansed, and if we have this new principle in our hearts, this love, this, this holy affection, then we will choose what is good. We will choose useful things. We will produce the fruits of godliness. And really, this is just another way, what Jesus is talking about here is just another way of saying that if we are justified, if we have trusted Jesus Christ and we have been declared just by God because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ and only because of his righteousness, we will be sanctified. We'll be bearing good fruit. We'll be turning away from sin, from the things that the Lord tells us are wrong, and we'll be doing what he says is right. Likewise, if our heart is evil, if we're still in the same condition that we, we came, you know, in which we came into the world, if our hearts have not been cleansed by the Spirit of God, then we will choose, again, what our heart desires, that which is bad, that which is useless, that which is evil. In other words, we will, instead of obeying God's law, we will be breaking God's law. So a good tree bears good fruit, a bad tree bears bad fruit. The good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good. The evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth what is evil. Now, Jesus uses another anal analogy in the Bible, uh, that of the vine and the branches, to remind us that really both of these types of trees, so to speak, are in the church as well, and they're represented by fruitful and unfruitful branches. Let me read to you that passage from John 15, verses 2 through 6. Jesus says, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, and by the way, there's no, no fruit branches here. He's talking about good fruit. They will bear fruit. It just won't be good fruit. It'll be bad fruit. But every branch in me that does not bear fruit, or in this case, use, uh, useful fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing." If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Now, Jesus here is telling us that if we're trusting in him, if we are you know, justified by him, if we're abiding in him, which means if, if we are connected to the vine by a, a, a vital or a living union, which is brought about by the Holy Spirit, we will be bearing fruit, okay? We'll be bearing good fruit, useful fruit. We will be doing what our Lord calls us to do. Again, not perfectly, but we will be doing it. And if that's, if that's our condition, if that's what we're doing, he says the Father will also help us bear more fruit. He will prune us. He's the, the vine dresser, and he comes through, and he, 
you know, he trims us back, as it were, and we, I, you know, if we knew a little bit more about um, horticulture in this regard and, and the work of, um, you know, how you work with, a, with a, a vine, we know that they are severely cut back in order that they might bear more fruit. Well, the Father does that from time to time. And he does it through difficulties. He does it through trials. He puts us in the crucible to purify us. It's a way of trimming us. And in the end, we end up bearing even more fruit than we did before, which means we'll become even more obedient. We'll become even more like our Lord Jesus Christ. And that to say that trials, as Peter reminds us, um, you know, uh, that's not some strange thing that comes upon us to try us. It's something that is a part of our Christian experience that we need to, um, well, we need to understand and, and reckon with. It's going to come, but it comes for a good purpose, and the purpose is that we might, uh, again, become more like Jesus. Uh, Jesus goes on to say in John chapter 15, although I didn't read this verse, that as we bear more fruit, this not only brings glory and honor to the Father, but it also proves to us and to others that we are the disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ. The good tree, again, bears good fruit. On the other hand, he tells us in this particular analogy that if we don't bear good fruit, if we don't bear useful fruit, but useless fruit, if, we don't, if we're barren with regard to useful fruit, if there is no sanctification, uh, because we're not really connected to Jesus, although in this analogy, remember, it looks like we are, it looks like we're connected, but it's not a vital union. We're a dead branch on the vine. We're not bearing fruit, okay? There's no justification. Uh, if we're not bearing fruit, we're not saved. Even though we look like we're connected to Jesus, we're really not. When the Father comes looking for fruit and he finds none, that branch actually gets pruned off. We are removed from the church. And we know that if we don't repent, if we don't trust in Jesus... If we don't eventually begin to obey him, uh, his angels one day will gather us up along with the rest of the wicked and throw us into the lake of fire where we will be burned. Now, Jesus certainly had the scribes and the Pharisees in mind when he said these things to his disciples. He wanted his disciples to be able to discern you know, whether they should listen to this person, whether they should follow this person, whether they should, you know, sit under them as a master, as a, as a disciple to that master. He wanted them to know who to avoid. Avoid the ones that are bearing bad fruit. A good tree bears good fruit, a bad tree bears bad fruit. But of course, he also wanted them to judge their own lives. I mean, this wouldn't be the first time that Jesus turned to his disciples and challenged them. And when I say disciples, I'm not talking about the, the 12 necessarily. Those were the 12 apostles. There were many more disciples. On one occasion, Jesus said something to his disciples about having to eat his flesh and drink his blood, remember? And virtually they all left. And then Jesus turned to the 12 and he says, do you want to leave as well? And Peter said, Lord, where else can we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. So Jesus is challenging those who are listening to him here to examine their own lives. And certainly we need to do the same thing, don't we? We need to take a step back and we need to examine our lives. And when we do that and we look at the fruit our lives are bearing, what, what do we see? Do we see useful fruit or useless fruit? Do we see obedience or do we see disobedience? Do we see the, the fruit of the Spirit? You know, if we have the Spirit of God in us, this will characterize our lives. Paul writes in Galatians 5, verses 22 through 23, but the fruit of the Spirit, that which he produces in our lives, is love. And as Jonathan Edwards pointed out, all of these following fruits can all be resolved or all express or explain what love is. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. This is love that is exercised in, in various ways or in differing relationships. Against such things there is no law. Do we see the fruit of the Spirit? Or do we see that of the flesh? Paul talks about in verses 19 through 21. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom 
of God. Now, I want to zero in on that word practice because that is very important when we're talking about this fruit. But before we get to that, Jesus points out more particularly in our passage the fruit of our lips, what it is we say. In, in verse 45 of Luke chapter 6, you know, as far as the, the good man brings forth out of the good treasure of his heart, you know, good things, but the evil man, evil things, for his mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. Here's another way we can examine the fruit of our lives. What, did, what is it that we're saying? How do our words impact other people? Are our words edifying? Are our words Christ-like? Do they build up those around us? Or do they tear them down? Now, as we're examining our fruit, we do need to be careful here because um, we also know from Scripture that no matter how sanctified we actually are, we're still going to you know, fall far short from perfection. These things that Paul told us are the fruits or the deeds of the flesh, they are still going to be in us to some degree, sadly. Uh, that's the part we're commanded to, to put to death, right? And we have to be doing that if we're going to ultimately live. But if we have the Spirit of God in us, there's a war going on in us that won't allow us to rest easy with, the, with this, these deeds of the flesh. So we will be fighting against these things. And we will be fighting to put on more of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're not going to be perfect. That's not what Jesus is talking about here. But Jesus is really speaking about the overall pattern of our lives. You know, what are we doing generally? If we are a good tree, if we have a good heart, we will practice what is good. We'll practice what is right. We will practice righteousness. But if we're a bad tree, if we have an evil heart, then the practice of our life is going to be uh, a sin. It's going to be, um, well, evil. Uh, John tells us in John, 1 John 3, verses 7 through 10. And again, these, these are words that um, we should meditate on often, uh, just as a reality check. And I think one we can also use for individuals that perhaps we're concerned, they may not really know the Lord. This is what John writes, little children. Make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. And by the way, it, it's, it's not only to destroy the devil, but to destroy the works of the devil and not just everything the devil does, but what he does in us as well. He came to destroy his hold upon us and to set us free from sin. Okay? No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him and he cannot sin, that is, practice sin, because he is born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God nor the one who does not love his brother. So this is what we need to apply to ourselves. Where are we? You know, are we practicing righteousness? Are we bearing, you know, good fruit? Are, are we showing ourselves, you know, the, I mean, basically what we do shows what we are because we act according to what is in our hearts. What do we see ourselves doing? That shows what we really are. But again, we're a mixed bag, okay? But if there is righteousness, if there's that love for what is good and, and right so that we are practicing the things that we know our Lord calls us to do, that shows that we are actually His even though we are imperfect. So we need to apply this to ourselves, but we also need to apply this test to others because Jesus intended his, those who heard Him also to apply this to the others that would pretend to be their, their teachers uh, we need to apply it to others. You know, as far as, our, as we're concerned, you know, who should we listen to? You know, should we listen to um, you know, this teacher or that teacher? Well, we need to, I think, examine what kind of fruit their lives are bearing to see whether or not we should listen to them. We need to examine, of course, what they're saying by the Word of God. We also need to um, examine. Again, we, we, we saw this is another example I should, I should mention of uh, what, it, what Jesus meant when he says, do not judge. Um, he didn't mean that we can't uh, 
judge um, uh, what a person's doing and make an evaluation about whether, whether what they're doing is right or wrong or whether they belong to Jesus or not, though we, we can't know for certain. We can, I think, know, uh, I think, uh, in, in a good degree. But he says, don't be, don't be harsh and quick to criticize and condemn other people is what he was saying. But here's another example of an evaluation. I mean, we are to be fruit inspectors. We need to inspect our fruit. We need to inspect others' fruit. So when somebody comes to us and they say they're a brother or sister in the Lord, should we receive them as a brother or sister in the Lord? Uh, or should we see them as one we should evangelize? How do we know? Well, we know by the fruit that they're bearing. We need to look and see how it is they are living. Now, again, we need to be careful here as well because um, every unbeliever you know, may sometimes look like they have the fruits of the Spirit. Um, they can never truly have them because they're void of the Spirit, right? But we're reminded in the Bible that uh, people can look like they belong to Jesus Christ. They can actually be doing the right things. And I think as long as they are doing those things that we need to receive them as believers, but they may be doing those things for entirely the wrong reasons. Only the Lord knows the heart. So we can be deceived, but again, because only the Lord can see the heart, but we also have to think if, if they continually bear useless fruit, bad fruit, if they're practicing sin, then regardless of what they say, we need to treat them as an unbeliever. Even if they might truly be a believer that's fallen into sin, we need to treat them as an unbeliever and seek to bring them to Jesus is what our Lord is, is telling us. So essentially, our Lord is calling us here to be fruit inspectors, right? We need to examine um, one another. We need to kind of, and you know, for a good reason, you know, to you know, perhaps correct one another if we see one another getting off or, again, people we care about who are professing faith in Christ. I mean, how many people do we know that claim to be Christians, but yet we see no evidence in their lives? And I've, I've heard so many people say, well, they claim to be a Christian, so maybe they are, you know. Well, words are cheap, as we know. It's not so much what we say, unless, of course, all those words happen to be bad words. Well, then that, that tells us, you know, what's really in their heart. But we need to look at their lives as a whole and draw our evaluation from that. Jesus says a good tree bears good fruit. You know, it bears useful fruit, useful to the Lord's glory. But a bad tree bears useless fruits. So may the Lord give us grace not only to, of course, evaluate others that we might help them ultimately, not condemn them, but help them. And may He also help us, again, judge our own experience according to this. Do we really know Him? If we do, we will be bringing useful fruit for the Lord's glory. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to help us and make that evaluation.